All right, so we have the recording going now, and now we'll check up, check out those upcoming assignments um, for our class. So if we go here to the course calendar, what we're going to see is that there is a few assignments due uh, for this week. Um, one of those was one from last week. I had a few folks say, oh, I, I tried to do it. I couldn't get it to submit. So I pushed it back a little bit. So they have a little bit more time to get it turned in. And that was um, getting used to normal data. Now, you guys that are on the line with me, I, I think you guys both did those. And what was cool about this is we are starting to get some normal data now. In fact, let's let's check that out real quick because we're, we're starting to build a normal uh, data list of known good values. So I took a couple of screenshots here um, and I did a section on engine coolant temperature sensors where we talked about how an engine coolant temperature sensor, you know, it, it's all about what temperature is that engine. And so that sensor is going to vary based on how long the engine is ran, right? So um, I put a hot idle at 180 to 220, depending upon what thermostats in that car and that type of thing. Normal driving would be about the same. And then the full range could be as low as negative 40 degrees, like if you unplug the sensor or maximum cold. And on the hot end of the spectrum, usually it's somewhere around 260 to maybe 300, depending upon the car. I also gave you some voltage ranges here um, that talked about, you know, four and a half to five volts full cold, 0.5 to 0.3 volts full hot. And that's why it's, it's considered to be a negative temperature coefficient sensor. You can see like the way the voltage goes, it drops a lot of voltage cold and a little bit hot. In fact, we're going to look at that sensor again, uh, tonight in tonight's presentation. Um, Zach talked about engine RPM. Uh, Luke here talked about the throttle position sensor, TPS. Um, uh, Alexander uh, talked about oxygen sensors, which is another thing we're going to talk about uh, tonight. And um, uh, Oscar here uh, went into the intake air temperature sensor, which will work very similar, it's essentially identical to coolant temp. It's just measuring the temperature of the intake air and not the temperature of the coolant. But those two guys will be used together for error correction. In fact, remember my tip is that uh, when you first start your car after it's been sitting all night, so the temperature has been able to normalize, the intake air temperature sensor should be reading the same as the coolant temperature sensor on that initial startup or within a few degrees of each other. So we're starting to build a pretty good custom data list. That was that assignment. I stretched it out a little bit for you guys if you haven't got it turned in so that you can you can do that assignment. Um, so if I go back to our course calendar, uh, the really the new things that we have for this week are the eight step diagnostic process. In fact, we have uh, talked about this quite a bit. I put up a little uh, flow chart here uh, showing a factory uh, diagnostic process. But um, anyways, what's that eight step diagnostic process? We talked about it in class session five. In fact, we're gonna talk about it tonight. Um, so I'm just trying to get that thing down in your memory banks so that it will become natural to you. Like if I have a check engine light code, I'm gonna do this, 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 and this. Uh, to figure out what's wrong. So that's that's a pretty quick and easy one to do. Um, I'll go back to the calendar and look at the last uh, assignment. And this one is about your communication protocol. Now we've talked about that actually like in, in class, like maybe one or two early on in the semester, we talked about uh, communication uh, protocols but we are gonna talk about them again tonight. Um, and so this assignment is about getting you to figure out, well, what communication protocol does your car use, okay? 
So that's what this uh, assignment is about, okay? And it gets you scanning your car and maybe looking some stuff up. All right, so with that, that's what's coming up on the agenda. Uh, as far as homework, what about tonight's presentation? Well, we are gonna be focusing in, just like it says on the announcement um, for today, we're gonna be looking at um, building custom data list. We're also gonna take a look at oxygen sensors um, and kind of put this all together. And, and then again, also take one of your case studies, one of your guys' problem cars, where you guys did the assignment where you said, well, what, what problems do you have on your cars? I'm gonna take one of those and use that for discussion as well. Okay, so we have lots of stuff there to go on. So let's let's jump into it. I'm going to change my screen share then. And um, we will get going here. Um, let me do this real quick. Boom, there it is. And we'll center out this screen a little bit better. Okay, so we're gonna be maximizing our scan tool. And I don't care if you have a little generic scan tool or you got a really expensive, um, you know, uh, snap-on tool or a factory tool, whatever tool you have, you wanna to try to get the maximum out of it, right? And so we're focusing, you know, getting the most out of our little interface. Um, and a lot of these same rules will still apply. So we're gonna be talking about making some custom data lists, uh, making movies, graphing data, um, basically doing everything we can with this tool to help us figure out what's wrong with the car. And I have a few examples for you on how to do that, okay? But first, we'll start with just a little bit of review. So, hey, here's that process again, that eight step. Okay, you could copy and paste this. This would be for, um, for your homework assignment this week, right? If you have a check engine light on on a, on a car, then this would be the process to go through to figure out what's wrong, right? And I have on here, remember that the scan tool, it does not replace your DMM or your lab scope right? It's just one more tool in your toolbox to help you figure out what's wrong with the car. So if we have a check engine light on, remember, we're going to always be jumping through these steps to figure out what's causing that code to be set. And we've talked about it several times where you have front door, back door information. If I'm hooking up my oscilloscope, I'm tapping into the front door. I'm testing sensors uh, or pro possibly outputs directly versus the scan data, it is computer interpreted data. It's backdoor information. Um, again, scanners are like your compass. They kind of get you in the right direction. Usually our scopes and things are our pinpoint test tools. Okay, and remember that your input sensors are front door whenever you're using your scanner. That's all backdoor stuff, right? And sometimes backdoor can lie to you. Keep in mind though, if we're jumping into OBD2 generic mode, the rules and regulations of OBD2 specifically say that we can't falsify data. So in that mode, the computer is not supposed to lie to you. So what, one of the advantages of um, OBD2 is should have no lies. We shouldn't have any lies from the back door if we're using OBD2 generic data. But again, it is scanner interpreted so maybe you got a communication issue. I mean, there, there is ways that it could be off, but it's not allowed to falsify information like it could. So, you know, there's a lot of power in that because you, you get in the manufacturer mode or side of a tool and you could have it giving you some misleading information. Okay, moving right along then. 
so that's all the old stuff and quite frankly this is still a little old but let's let's jump into our process again our check engine light is on right so if the check engine lights on we know that we're going to do steps one two and three we're going to verify the complaint right well the complaint is that hey the check engine lights on boom i see it's on okay i verified it so i'm going to jump in with my scan tool and i'm going to pull codes and when it says record it means i'm going to write those codes down or if i'm using an app like this i'm going to take a screenshot of it with my phone i'm going to do something to save that information and then I'm always going to pull the freeze frame, right? That's what was going on when the very first code was set. Now, here, here's an important thing to understand is that this is for the first code set. That is the regulation. regulation. So... Um, if your car has five codes in it, guess what? You're only going to have a freeze frame for the very first code that was set, okay? So that's some of the limitations of that. An example of a manufacturer tool or a professional tool would be like if I was on a General Motors product, they added a feature called failure records where they could store up to 10, I want to say 10 freeze frames. So you could have a freeze frame for multiple codes but that's not part of the OBD2 generic regulations. So you generally speaking will only get a freeze frame for the very first code that was set, okay? So we're gonna do uh, steps one through three. Yep, the check engine lights on. Two, what are the codes? I'm gonna write those down. Three, what was the conditions when the, that the car is being driven and when that code was set, right? That tells us a lot about enable criteria. Remember that enable criteria, that's the conditions that the car has to be driven in to get a monitor to run. That's your conditions necessary for monitors to run. So enable criteria is really important because when we're done with our repairs, we're gonna to want to drive the car the same way to verify those repairs. So with all that, I think there's one other thing to say that's really important right now, is at this point, do not clear the codes, okay? It is really important that you do not try to clear the codes at this point, because if you do, you're gonna lose your freeze frame information, you're gonna reset all the monitors and, and by doing so, you might lose some important information that, that you need, okay? So I don't recommend clearing the codes at this point. I recommend going on a step four, which is starting to look at that scan data, okay? I feel like too many people, they pull the codes and they go, oh, okay, here's the codes, and then boom, they clear it. Sometimes they pull the code so fast, they don't even remember what it was, and they're like, I don't know what it was, I just cleared it. Well, great it might take me a lot of time driving the vehicle to get that code to set again. Why is that? Well, because of the way OBD2 works and this enable criteria thing, right? It might take a certain way for me to drive the car to meet the enable criteria, to get the monitor to run, to get the code to set. And, you know, it's, it, that could be a real pain. So, don't do that. Don't clear the codes until we start analyzing some data and we have a direction on where we're going. Really, I don't like to clear the codes until after I've done my repair. Okay, so moving right along. I'll clear out those drawings. So earlier this semester, we talked about the big six or what I've then modified to be the great eight data parameter pits, right? So at this point, what we're doing on our, on our diagnostic process is we've done steps one two, one, two, and three. We pulled the codes, pulled the freeze frame, and now we're analyzing that scan data and we're asking ourselves, does the, does the scan data support the code? 
um, does it match the freeze frame? Like, does, does this make sense? Does the code that's set kind of line up with the data that we're seeing? It's always nice if it does, because it's usually going to be an easier diagnostic. If the data is different or it doesn't line up, well, it's going to cause you to do more investigation. Okay. So here we're analyzing the scan data. And my question is, well, how best do we do that? Because we have some options, right? If we're using our little cell phone app right here, we could, we could click all sensors right here. And by doing that, we could just look at all the sensors, all the PIDs that this little scanner can, can pull from the computer. We're going to look at all of those, right? But the other thing we can do is we could set up a custom data list and just look at the things that we want to look at. And that's what we have as an option right here where it says live data. And so I might start here with all sensors, but I'm probably going to then quickly jump into live data and kind of narrow this thing down. And let me explain to you why I like to do that. Okay, first of all, well, we'll come back here. First of all, it has to do a little bit about the OBD2 protocols and something we call baud rate or how fast can the computer communicate to maybe the other computers on the car for that matter, but also how fast can it communicate to our scan tools? Remember that the scanner when i plug him in when i plug this scanner into my car this guy becomes another computer on the network so how quickly can it talk to the other computers and receive this series of ones and zeros and from that form a data list for me form all those pids that i'm going to see on my screen right well it depends we talked about how there's different communication protocols, essentially those are like uh, languages, right? So when we say com communication protocol, think of this as a computer language. Um, oops, I forgot, a, forgot the U in there, but anyways. Um, so I put a couple up on the screen, okay? Um, J1850 variable pulse width or VPM, uh, J1850, well, he spoke at uh, usually somewhere between a 10.4 to up to on the later ones, a 41.6 kilobit per second baud rate, okay? Who used that mostly? General Motors, the general used that. Well, Ford also used J1850, but they did it with pulse width modulation and got it running a little faster. So that, that was their deal. What about ISO 9141? Again, a different communication protocol. Uh, not necessarily a lot faster when we looked at the speeds. So it's not a lot faster. Well, he used that a lot of your Asian imports, your European stuff, some Chrysler cars. Um, again, not lightning fast, but that was a protocol that they used, okay? One thing that you look at on newer cars is you'll likely notice that they communicate a lot faster. And that is because starting in the early 2000s and then being mandated across the board in 2008, we switched over to CAN. Now CAN stands for Controller Area Network. Okay, I'll go ahead and type that on the, on the screen. Controller Area Network or CAN. So it talks lightning fast, okay? Um, and you could have it be CAN commu communication to your scan tool. It could be CAN communication to the other computers on the car. And you could have a car that has multiple protocols on it, but remember, it's going to have some type of gateway module. One of the computers is going to be the protocol droid, if you will, or that um, 
that uh, translator to get everything to speak the same language so that when it, it, all that data can then go to your scan tool and the car can function properly. A question I recently had is, well, why would you have different protocols on the same car? Well, if certain components don't need to speak together really fast, I can, you know, like if a power window switch, that doesn't need to respond super fast. So I don't need to make it the latest and greatest and the most expensive electronics in that thing. I can have it be made a little bit cheaper with a little slower electronics with a slower baud rate and still get the job done. So it really comes down to a matter of cost. Uh, and that's why you're likely to see multiple communication protocols on the car, okay? So what we're talking about right here, these are just the protocols, common protocols. And there's a couple that I don't have on. Uh, Keyword protocol 2000 is one that comes to mind. But these are the common protocols that you would see uh, between this, the computer and your OBD2 scan tool. Okay, so why would we make a custom data list? Why would we do that? Well, that gets us back to uh, this big six and this great eight. Like, why, why do I not want to look at everything? Well, the reason I don't want to look at everything is everything could kind of overwhelm me. Maybe I don't know what to look at. These six parameters or eight parameters um, will give you a good idea of how is this engine running, right? So these aren't the best parameters if you're fighting uh, every single problem on your car. It's not the best maybe for like a catalyst code, but if you generally want to know, well, how's the engine running? These parameters work really good. So what, what do we have here again? Well, we have our engine RPM. Why is that up at the top? That's the most important sensor on the car, right? If you don't have an RPM signal going to the computer, there's no reason for it to run the engine at all, okay? So I want to know what the RPM is. I want to know what my airflow is. And there's two different ways I could, if, if I'm the computer, I could learn about airflow. And that's either by the mass airflow sensor or by the map sensor. And some cars have one or the other. Some cars might have both. And if they have both, maybe I'll punch them both up to see if they kind of correspond to each other, okay? Obviously, both of those guys should then respond to what the throttle says, because as I open up the throttle, I should see the RPM increase. And I should also see the mass airflow sensor uh, data increase, okay? Coolant temperature, well, that affects the way the engine runs. That's a pretty big, important one. So coolant temperature, this guy, as we're going to get in tonight, also is big in determining, and I'll put it up here, open or closed loop. Okay. And then ultimately, my O2 sensors and fuel trim, basically, this is, this is my feedback. This lets me know, well, what kind of adjusting am I doing, okay? Now, if you wanna add a couple extra PIDs on there, I think it's always smart to look at the air take, intake air temperature sensor. A lot of times I'll add on the load that the engine calculates, because that should line up with those guys as well. And it makes it handy for um, trying to meet enable criteria. Um, uh, so like if I'm trying to duplicate what happened in the freeze frame, having that load percentage PID is nice. And then don't forget that your uh, O2 sensors, you could have a right bank and a left bank, and you can also have fuel trims that then are both long-term fuel trim and short-term fuel trim and of course, a, a right bank and a left bank. So this thing's, it's really easy where you start at six parameters and you might grow out to 10 parameters, okay? Well, our little cell phone based scan tool, if I want to graph the things individually, it limits me to four at a time. So then what I would do is I, I just take these things and I chunk them into four parameters at, in, in a section and I'll look at the first four, then I'll look at the second four and, 
then I don't have to, as much stuff to look at at once. It lets my brain process it a little bit better. But there's another reason why I would be inclined uh, to do this. Okay, and here we can see on, that's on the Snap-on scanner where we're making a custom data list. Um, this little check mark right here means, hey man, I want a custom data list. And then from there you click that and the next page you can go through and select what parameters or what PIDs do I want to look at? So here we've selected the map sensor. We've selected bank one sensor one oxygen sensor voltage and bank one sensor two oxygen sensor voltage. So if I thought I had a catalyst efficiency uh, situation, um, that those would be two sensors that I would be interested in, in looking at. That's that's for sure. So. Um, all right, so custom data list, but we're still kind of getting to the why. So part of it is, you know, for our brain, so we're not overwhelmed. But the other part relates to these protocols and their baud rates or their communication speeds. Because um, by default, the scan tool collects all the data PIDs, right? Well, the custom data list allows us to choose exactly what we want. And that means that these PIDs will be displayed faster. Basically what this does is it increases the refresh rate. So especially if I have one of the older cars with the older communication protocol, that's quite frankly slower, um, you can speed things up a, a lot, speed up the refresh rate by doing a custom data list. And that was another huge advantage of that is not only were you not overwhelming your brain, but you weren't overwhelming your tool and what the vehicle's communication speeds could support, okay? Now, when we go to controller area networks, you'll find that, you know, on a newer car, they can communicate so much faster that it's usually not a big deal. Um, uh, you still seem to get a little bit better refresh though, and a little bit faster and more responsive data though, when you do a custom data list. My last tip I have on this particular slide is that, yeah, you know what, graphing the PIDs, graphing stuff out just makes it easier to see trends, right? I could just have engine RPM flashing on my screen or I could graph it out and I could see what it's doing over time, right? And if I wanna see if the RPM is matching what the mass airflow sensor is telling me by graphing it out, it makes it much more obvious to see. So here we can see the um, manifold absolute pressure and how it's changing um, on there. And so, you know, anyways, we're, we're seeing how stuff corresponds together. Now, this was actually, this is from the demo mode of the Snap-on scanner. And so basically they have one little short segment that they replay over and over and over is all you're looking at there. Um, so the car was idling, they did a snap throttle and then they let it idle again. And that's that's what you're seeing on that on that graph. But if, if you don't have it on graphing mode, it's hard to realize that, oh, I'm looking at the same thing kind of same same little bit of data that's repeating over and over again. So graphing stuff makes it really easy to see trends and just makes the data more visible. So that's one of my other tips is whenever possible, I like to graph out that data. <clears throat> okay. So um, getting back to our, um, actually, Getting back to our eight step diagnostic process. Let me back up a few slides here. All right. If, uh, if at this point, you know, we pulled the codes, the freeze frame, we looked at the scan data, and it is supporting what we think it's supposed to support, right? Like it is matching up, right? Now I'm in the mode where, yeah, I need to service some inf service information. Maybe I need to learn a little bit more. But ultimately, before I make repairs, I'm gonna be getting into my pinpoint testing, right? So it's step six where we're really zeroing in on 
what is the exact problem with the car. Okay, so that's what we're jumping into next. And there are ways that you can use the scanner to help you speed up your pinpoint testing, okay? And I'm gonna give you uh, an example right now. So with that, we'll clear out those drawings and we'll skip back to where we were. All right, so um, we're gonna use that engine coolant temperature sensor again as an example. And if I had a code for this, or I could have a code related to this um, because we're gonna use this coolant temperature sensor for all kinds of things. Like we can not only set codes for the sensor, but we have other things that the computer is monitoring um, related to this sensor. So I'm gonna type into the screen here something that you guys probably don't think of as, as an input to the computer, but it is one. So. Okay, computer inputs. Fine. So one of the things the computer is looking at is how much time has occurred from startup, okay? Why is that a big deal? Well, for something like the coolant temperature sensor, the engineers have, will, will learn through testing their engine design and stuff, they'll learn that, you know, it's, you should have X, you know, uh, number of degrees of rise in temperature Over, over a certain period of time. So um, a modern car not only can set codes for our temperature sensor, but it can set codes for the thermostat itself. I'll never forget that, um, you know, I and this is why, you know, you, you get involved with family and friends. And so myself and one of my counterparts from the college uh, John McCormick, we went down to Southern California for a training. He had family down in Southern California. And of course, once they found out that he was down here, they started calling him with car problems, right? This is probably uh, a problem that some of you guys are going to have. Well, they had a Jaguar or something, and it was it was failing smog check because it had a check engine light on, and it was setting codes for the thermostat. Well, how could it set codes for the thermostat? Well, it looked at the coolant temperature sensor and it looked at how much time had elapsed and it said, hey, that doesn't compute because if that engine is ran, let's say for five minutes and when it first started, it was like 70 degrees. If it's ran for five minutes, it should be up to, let's say 130 degrees, right? That's all programmed in there. And so if it doesn't meet that temperature threshold, but it does see the, the sensor rising in temperature, it goes, okay, well, the sensor's okay, but the thermostat must be stuck open. And lo and behold, what we found on that car is that somebody at some point, for whatever reason, maybe they thought they were hot rotting it out, but they decided that they were going to drill a bunch of holes in the thermostat to make it flow more coolant or something. And then that was causing it to have thermostat codes. Um, so anyways, knowledge of the circuit, right? So if we had a thermostat code, if we had a code that was related to the temperature sensor in any way, there are ways that we can eliminate the circuit and do that rather quickly. For example, if I switch this to the next slide here, I have, how would you test the circuit? Well. I've actually had this slide in one of our screens before. And of course, on the slide, you can see that we have a digital volt ohmmeter or a multimeter here. And we could, we could pinpoint test with our multimeter, but we can also take advantage of our scan tool. 
So here we have our OBD2 generic scan tool. That would be our interface. And why do we have it in generic mode? Because remember, it's not allowed to lie to you on generic mode. So if you know how the circuit works, it really aids to your, to your diagnosis. It makes things a lot easier. So for example, this particular circuit, this is a voltage divider circuit. You can see that the computer supplies five volts on this line. And if I go back a picture, a slide here, you see that coolant temperature sensor, it's two wires. Almost all of these are two wire sensors, okay? So on one wire, it supplies a five volt uh, signal. Um, now what you'll notice is that right off the bat, it goes through a resistor. This resistor is inside the computer. Where's the signal wire? The signal wire is actually inside the computer tapping off this line right past that resistor. The other end of this then is going out, you know, through the wiring harness to the actual sensor. That sensor then is screwed into the engine block and its resistance is gonna vary with the temperature of the engine. And on the other line, then we get our ground signal going back, our ground return going back to the computer, right? Um, so what we have here, essentially, if I draw this out again, is we have one resistor, I'm not very good drawing of a resistor. We have another resistor, which is the actual coolant temperature sensor. And we have our signal being taken right in the middle. So we call this a voltage divider because I'm going to have a voltage drop from this guy and a voltage drop from that guy. And it's all proportional to the resistance of each one of these things. So if the resistance of this guy goes up because it's cold out, he's gonna drop more of the voltage. If his resistance goes down, then he's gonna drop less of the voltage. And so when we talked about how this thing would be like close to five volts cold, and I'll type that in. Well, essentially, it's like we're measuring, the computer's measuring the voltage drop across this back half of the circuit. So, long story short, hey, the scanner's looking, it's displaying at what the computer sees on that signal wire, right? So, if I were to disconnect this line, if I were to unplug the sensor, okay, Essentially, his resistance would go way up. It would go to infinite resistance. So I would expect this thing to go to 5 volts, which would be full cold. And what should my scanner say? My scanner should say full cold, right? Whatever's programmed in the computer is full cold. That might be 40 degrees below zero on the Fahrenheit scale. It might be 10 degrees below below zero Celsius, what you know, whatever, it's going to go to full cold, whatever that is. Now, the other thing I could do is I could say, okay, well, with the coolant temperature sensor unplugged, I could take a paper clip or J tool and basically bridge these wires together. And you go, oh my goodness, I'm shorting something. Isn't that going to hurt the computer? No, because it's got this resistor right here. Okay. So what we're doing by jumpering these two with the paper clip is we're simulating a fully hot engine, okay? So if we unplug it, it should go to 40 degrees below zero or whatever is full cold on the computer. I'm by jumpering the wires together, it should then go up to full hot. So maybe that's 300 degrees Fahrenheit. Well, if I disconnected the sensor, it went to 40 below. If I then jumpered it, it went to full hot. That tells me that the wiring, basically everything past the sensor has to be good, right? 
as far as the electrical circuit and the computer's logic and all that type of stuff, that has to be working. And at that point, my problem has to be the sensor or, you know, something mechanical, right? Like maybe the sensor's not screwed in properly, or maybe there's so much corrosion in the cooling system. This, the sensor is not getting a good reading because of that. Or maybe somebody's drilled a bunch of holes in the thermostat or something. Um, but now it's a, it's a mechanical problem. So I've kind of divided out those things. Um, so there are ways that you can pinpoint test with your scan tool, but it requires you to really fully understand how the circuit works, okay? So I wanted to kind of go over this example again and show you how there is different ways that we can really leverage that generic scan tool. Okay. Um, so hopefully that, that made sense. And it's kind of interesting. Now, a couple of the parameters that were part of our big six or grade eight were the O2 sensors, right? And again, when I'm going to say circuit knowledge is important for pinpoint diagnosis. Um, O2 sensors are a big deal because they give us our feedback. Now, what's this feedback? The feedback is, well, how is the engine running, right? Is it running rich or lean? And so that's, that's really important. So if we're trying to establish a condition, is the car running too rich? Is the car running too lean? Does the car have a misfire, right? Like, you know, O2 sensors are important for, for that, okay? So if we're gonna trust what the O2 sensors are telling us on our scan tool, we gotta kind of know how they work as well, right? So we're gonna shift gears a little bit, talk a little bit about oxygen sensors and a little bit about fuel control strategies, okay? Because this is an important thing. It's like, you can't do one without the other, right? If you don't have any circuit knowledge, essentially, you're pretty much limited to, you know, pulling codes and throwing parts at the car that relate to the codes. We got to have some knowledge to try to start deciphering this data, right? So oxygen sensors. Um, well, they're important because they relate to uh, fuel control. And uh, what I have here is that changes to your fuel delivery, right, is based on O2 sensor calculations. So when you first start your car, you are in open loop, okay? Open loop. Well, what does that mean? It means, hey, the car is cold, insufficient engine temperature, okay? So what's one of the big things that determines whether I'm going to stay in open loop or not, that coolant temperature sensor, okay? So I have here, if the system is not no closed loop, it's going to be an open loop. And that's typically going to be when the car is cold, okay? So open loop means, if I get my text tool up here, when I'm in open loop, I'm not... I'm not responding to the O2 sensor, okay? I'm not necessarily ignoring it. I'm waiting for it to start working, okay? Because when I'm in open loop, the O2 sensor is not gonna be working real well correctly. And so we gotta get the engine up to temperature. We gotta get the O2 sensor up to temperature. So it's working properly before I'm gonna start listening to the O2 sensor, okay? Versus, if I clear out these drawings, Oh, one important thing, air fuel mixtures. Yeah, they're rich right now. Richer than 14.7 to one or richer than stoichiometric, we would call that. Okay, closed loop operation then is now we're gonna change our fuel delivery based on the O2 sensor. So now we are listening to the O2 sensor, okay? We're basing what we're doing on what he's telling us. So what's the enable criteria, if you will, to go into closed loop? 
well, the engine has to be at normal operating temperature. Okay, so uh, for a lot of uh, older cars, that was you know usually around 160 degrees. Um, some newer cars, they can get in, go in a closed loop as early as 130 degrees. Um, so I'll put that 160 degrees up there on the screen. So the engine's got to get up to temperature. And it says PCM internal timer is timed out. So again, time is an input. So it could be as little as maybe 30 seconds. Some of the old cars had a two minute timer. So even if the car was hot, if you restarted it, it would be in open loop for two minutes before it would go into closed loop because of that timer function. We have an O2 sensor that's producing a reliable signal. What does that mean? The computer has to see some type of signal coming off of this thing that is somewhat believable. So I'm gonna put here on my text, I'm gonna say that the O2 sensor is not open or shorted. Okay. And then uh, engine operating at part throttle light load. Um, air fuel mixtures in control at 14.7 to one. So why do we have engine operating at part throttle light load? Well, because at wide open throttle, I go back to open loop. Okay, so if you're if you're floored out there, the throttle position sensor is going to see that. So it says, hey, this guy's floored. He's pedaled the metal. I don't care what the O2 sensor says. I'm going to dump a bunch of fuel in the motor to make, make horsepower, right? So if I'm at wide open throttle, I'm going to be in open loop. Now, that's a really important thing, guys, because what we have here is we've just established two sensors that can keep us out of closed loop, right? Our coolant temperature sensor, if he is mixed up, he will prevent us from getting in the closed loop. Also, our um, throttle position sensor, if it is signaling that we are at wide open throttles or usually somewhere or closer to three quarters of a throttle or more, it's going to go open loop and it's not going to listen to the O2 sensor. So in either one of those conditions, I'm going to go back to open loop operation. Okay. The purpose of closed loop, the, the, the whole game of this whole operation is to get right here at a 14.7 to one air fuel ratio. So this is air versus fuel. Okay. What do we want? We want 14.7 pounds of air to go in the engine for every one pound of fuel that goes in the engine. If we do that in that ratio, that's a good ratio that gives you pretty good performance, pretty good fuel economy, lets the catalytic converter work, and that means your emissions are going to be relatively low. Okay, So that's what it's all about. It's a good overall compromise. We call it a, a funny, we call it stoichiometric air fuel ratio or 14.7 to one for an engine that's running on gasoline, okay? That's what we're trying to do with our oxygen sensors. That's the whole goal of all this stuff. And that's one thing that fuel injection can do a lot better than carburetors could do. So with our oxygen sensor, what is it like? Well, your typical oxygen sensor, like I have right here, um, this thing is like a little tiny battery, okay? It's a little battery inside here um, in that it produces a little bit of voltage, okay? It's got a zirconium element in there. The outside of the tube is exposed, so, so it's kind of hard to... Um, to see here, but take it out of the wrapping and I'll try not to get the anti-seize all over. Um, one of my tips for you guys is if you're gonna have an O2 sensor, always get one that's a direct fit that you can just plug right into the car, spend the extra money. This is a small signal. I think I've shared this before. It's a zero to one volt signal. So 
I, you know, I don't want to lose any voltage there through a bad electrical connection. So I always recommend getting one that's a direct fit. But if, if I were to take off this little metal shell here and look inside that metal shell, and if I orient it just like that, what's inside there is this little ceramic element right here, okay? that's coated with platinum and they call it a hollow zirconium element, okay? Um, coated with platinum, the center of the tube is exposed to oxygen. So it doesn't look like it, but air is allowed to go on the inside. So if you look at, um, your oxygen sensor, you look on the outside, you'll see that, hey, this thing's kind of crimped together and it actually has air vents on the outside to let the oxygen get on the inside of the sensor. Well, then it's, it's comparing that to how much oxygen is in the exhaust gases going on the other side. So in here, this is where I have my exhaust gases blowing through the exhaust system. And if there's less oxygen in there, there's gonna be more conductance, meaning that it's gonna make more voltage. So it's gonna go up to one volt. And if there's oxygen in the exhaust, so I'll, I'll put some O2, O2, that means the voltage is gonna go down. And so now it might be down to 0.1 volts. Okay. So it's like a little tiny battery. And one thing I like to think about this O2 sensor as being a little tiny battery, just like every little tiny battery, eventually this sector is going to go dead, right? So O2 sensors do have a lifespan to them. And at some point, usually somewhere, you know, might be as low as 60,000 miles or 30,000 miles, could be up to 100,000 miles, but at some point it's going to hit a mileage interval where that O2 sensor goes dead like a little battery and quits producing a signal, okay? Well, if it quits producing a signal, now that can put us in open loop and the, the car, you know, the car might not know to not believe it. It can make the car run bad. It could definitely make it fail smog. So all that stuff's bad. So one thing I want to get across is that oxygen sensors by their nature and air fuel ratio sensors for that matter, they do have a lifespan to them and they will eventually fail. And usually when they fail, their signal goes low. Okay. So difference between the oxygen on the outside versus the oxygen inside the exhaust system, right? And that causes a difference in chemistry, which causes a voltage to be produced from the sensor the maximum voltage you would get off of a zirconia oxygen sensor will be 1.2 volts, okay? Usually right around a volt. So on my chart here, I have, okay, 900 millivolts, low O2, what does that mean? That means that my exhaust is rich. Notice what the computer's command is. The computer says, okay, go lean, okay? The command that the computer's gonna make is always the opposite of the condition. So if the O2 sensor says, hey man, you're rich, the computer's gonna say, okay, go lean. If the O2 sensor is, hey, you're lean, the computer's gonna say, okay, dump some fuel, go rich, okay? So by, by contrast, if I have a high amount of O2 in the exhaust, right? It's gonna make a low voltage because it's going to say, hey, I'm, I'm too lean. So what's the computer going to do in the car? It's going to say, okay, go rich, add fuel. All right. So that's, that's the logic there to it. So low O2 voltage signal, less than about 300 millivolts means that, hey, I'm lean now and the computer is going to go rich. It's going to turn on the fuel injectors a little bit longer. It's going to add extra fuel, okay? And then likewise, 
it'll switch back and forth. The normal operating range of an O2 sensor is typically between 100 to 900 millivolts. Or another way I could say that would be 0.1 volts to 0.9 volts, okay? Now, typically you should have three to five transitions, meaning going from you know, rich to lean, lean to rich, right? Going from one way to the other every couple of seconds, okay? And those should average out to 450 millivolts. So when you look at the signal, it'll be rich, lean, rich, lean, rich, lean. That's what you should see. In fact, in fact, we call this functionality of this sensor, um, it operates on a cycle limit theory in that if it's constantly going rich lean, rich lean, rich lean, what it's gonna average out to is this 450 millivolts, right? Right in the middle. And that happens to be that stoichiometric air fuel ratio. That's, that's what we want, okay? So the average is a clean running car. It's not running too rich or too lean because as soon as he goes a little bit rich, oh, we counteract that. And as soon as we go a little bit lean, we counteract that. And what we average out is an air fuel ratio that's right where we want to be, which is that 14.7 to 1, 14.7 pounds of air to one pound of fuel going in the motor as it runs. Okay. Um, so I have here on a response test, it's supposed to be able to go from lean to rich in less than 100 milliseconds. So last week we talked about mode five. I'm going to put that up on the screen here. Um, mode five was about the O2 sensors. And one of the tests that would do is the response test. And it was looking for it to do that transition in less than a hundred milliseconds. And if it doesn't do that, it will set codes for a lazy oxygen sensor. Okay. Um, what is going to cause this thing to fail? Well, failures oftentimes consist of a contaminated sensor or a sensor that's biased high or a sensor that's biased low. The normal depth, depth of a O2 sensor is like a little battery. It's going to die and it's going to fail low. They can bias high, but biasing low or failing low is more common. Okay, so moving right along, look at all these contaminations we have. So we have an oil contaminated O2 sensor. Okay, that means if your engine's burning a lot of oil, what's it gonna do eventually? It's gonna kill your oxygen sensors. It can also kill your catalytic converter. What will typically kill an oxygen sensor will also kill a catalytic converter, okay? Now, when I, well, let's look at some more of these killers. An excessively rich mixture can kill an oxygen sensor. So here's a scenario. The coolant temp sensor fails. The engine stays in open loop all the time. It runs too rich. The rich run then contaminates the O2 sensors and they go bad as well. You fix the coolant temperature sensor and you're still not done, okay? So rich run can kill those O2 sensors. Silicone contaminated. Now we don't see this as much anymore but you know, mechanics for years have liked their silicone sealers. The older silicone sealers, if they got into the engine and it burned those, those, those sealants, those things would contaminate the O2 sensor. And a big one is coolant. So if you have a blown head gasket on your car, it's very likely to contaminate your oxygen sensors and bias those things, okay? So if you've been driving around for hundreds of miles with a blown head gasket, it's going to wipe out your oxygen sensors, and it can also wipe out your catalytic converter. Okay. And then leaded fuel. A friend of mine, you know, she, she bought a bunch of leaded fuel for a race car, and uh, she was running a vintage race car and ended up not racing it because like most vintage race cars, of course, it broke down, so they couldn't race it. Um, 
So she was going to put it in her more modern car. And I said, well, you could do that, but it will start to contaminate your oxygen sensors. Now on a race car, is that a big deal? Probably not that big of a deal because you're always at wide open throttle anyways, which means you would be, you guessed it, an open loop. So I don't think it would be that big of a deal, but it is going to, it is going to end up contaminating running leaded fuel will contaminate your sensors. Um, now, before we jump into that, you might be sitting there thinking, well, why, you know, why is all this going to contaminate these sensors? All right, well, let's go back to the, our smaller screen share. Um, it all comes back to how it works. Um, it's all about this sensor element in the exhaust, okay? It doesn't uh, look like it. It doesn't necessarily do it justice but the exhaust gases have to be able to permeate that sensor, okay? Diffuse through it, essentially. Diffuse through the ceramic zirconium element. That's why there's holes in this metal shell, right? The exhaust gases, the oxygen, has to be able to diffuse from the outside and pass through the inside and all that type of stuff. So this membrane that's underneath this metal shell it's porous, it's breathable, okay? And what that means, guys, what that means is, is that when I look at all these different contaminations, what's happening is that you're having some foreign element, right? Coolant, oil, carbon buildup from running too rich that basically clogs up that porous element and doesn't allow it to breathe. So that's what all those O2 sensor killers. And like I said, they also damage your catalytic converter. That's what they all have in common is they clog up the pores and don't allow it to breathe. And if it can't breathe, if it can't compare the oxygen on the outside to the oxygen on the inside, it cannot function. Okay. So it's all, it's all about that membrane in there. It's all about that ceramic element being able to, um, to breathe. Okay, so so hopefully um, hopefully that makes sense. So what have we um, what have we talked about tonight uh, so far? Well, we hit you up with that eight step diagnostic process again, right? Where we verify the complaint. Yep, pull the codes, check the freeze frame data, write that down, look at the scan data and analyze it. And we spent a lot of time talking about making custom data lists and I'll show you how to do that in a second uh, on our little app. Um, and then reviewing service information. So let's, <clears throat> let's again put this to the test, but let's do this on uh, your cars. And we worked in a little bit of circuit uh, diagnosis with, with some knowledge of circuits like coolant temperature sensors and oxygen sensors. So here's our case study. Now, I don't know if this is the, this isn't the picture of, of his actual car, but here's the car. Um, 1998 Lexus ES300. Okay, so it's a nice looking car there. And what does it have? It has a P0420. And of course, that's going to be a failure for smog check for certain. Okay. So, um, Again, well, here's what we're going to do before we jump into our next slide. We are going to go, we'll go from our home screen there, but what we're going to do is we're going to go into ShopKey Pro. And what you'll see is I have punched in a couple of things. I put in our 1998 Lexus and I also typed in our code. And when I did that, I typed, put in the car, I put in our code, and I came up to this page right here by using the one search plus function, right? Now, this is a great screen because from here, I'm going to get some more information of, well, you know, what is a P0420? I'm sure that some of you guys know that code, you've recognized it, you've dealt, it, you've dealt with it before. Remember, the nice thing about OBD2 is a P0420 on this Lexus means the same thing as a P0420 on a Chevy 
or a Ford or a, you know, a Ferrari for that matter, because it's an OBD2 generic mode uh, code. How do I know it's a generic code? Because of that second digit being a zero, okay? So P0420, uh, what is that thing? Well, we'll erase the drawings here. We'll get the mouse working. And what we're gonna do is we're gonna go to component Oper description and operation. What is this thing? Okay. So you guys couldn't even see that. Hang on a second here. Let me go back. All right. So now let me make sure this is working right. Now you can see ShopKey Pro, guys. Uh, you guys should have been blowing me up on the chat there saying, hey, I can't see it. Um, so what have I done here? I have entered in the vehicle, 1998 Lexus ES300. I'd entered in the code, and now I can learn what the heck is this code. So where I like to start is component description and operation. And it tells me how this thing works. The ECM compares waveforms um so first of all what is this thing oh it's catalyst system efficiency below the threshold okay so a p0420 code what does that stand for it stands for your your cat catalytic converter is smoked out right it's efficiency is below the threshold okay remember how we talked about obd2 one of its goals is not it's not, the goals really aren't like generic, you know, codes for everybody in a, a common diagnostic connector. The main goal with OBD2 was to monitor the emissions over the life of the vehicle and to detect things that are degraded. So even before you would fail an emissions test, the car is going to know, hey, the emissions are going up because stuff's not testing out right. One of those new tests that came about that we didn't test on cars in the 80s that we do test on cars that are OBD2 is the efficiency of the catalytic converters, okay? So, um, you know, on an older car, maybe you could have a, a, a catalytic converter that's that's low efficiency, that's, that's crapped out, so to speak, that's not working right. Um, and, you know, that might cause it to fail the smog check out the tailpipe, um, but it wouldn't necessarily cause it to set a check engine light. With an OBD2 car, it will, because why? Well, the computer is going to compare the waveform of the oxygen sensor in front of the catalytic converter with the oxygen sensor behind the catalytic converter to determine if it's deteriorated. If it's functioning properly, the waveform after the converter will be, uh, will switch back and forth ritually much more slowly than the waveform in the front, okay? So it tells us what it's looking for. It tells us kind of how it works, okay? And so that's what I love about that description of operation in ShopKey Pro. That's where I can go to learn about how does this work? What is the enable criteria? All that type of stuff. There's other things that I'm gonna throw, show you real fast. Um, for example, like real fixes, uh, you have people's different, uh, different uh, repairs on there. Um, if I go back, top repairs, this is a graph over mileage. If you're over, let's say 130,000 miles, yeah, it's very likely that you need a catalytic converter. That's what most people are reporting. But you can't just replace, replace the part on that alone. You have to do some investigation, right? So what we're gonna do is we're gonna switch our screen share back to our presentation. So here's our car, right? And we start our eight step diagnostic process. So we verified codes and, you know, we would look at our freeze frame data, which would probably show it going down the freeway or something. And then we would look at our, um, our O2 sensors. So let me go like this and let me change that screen share again. Okay, so remember that O2 sensors should be switching back and forth, rich lean, rich lean, rich lean. So 
here, I have good normal operation. That's what it should look like. Um, if it was biased high, it would look like this, which would make the car. So, this, and then if it was biased low, I should say, uh, it would look like that. And then if you had a sensor that was kind of dying out, it'd probably look something like this, right? Okay, so here's what's weird. Um, remember that the command is always opposite of the condition. So what what is it? What does this mean? What well, if the O2 sensor was hanging out more at the top, it would be saying, "Hey man, you're rich. You're rich. You're rich." The computer would be its response would be, "Oh, try to run it lean." Um, if the O2 sensor was low all the time, the computer would think, hey, the car is running lean. I'm going to try to run it rich. So the typical way an O2 sensor fails, like I said, is it's going to fail like a battery goes dead, right? It's going to go low voltage. And remember that lean equals low. The command is opposite the condition. So as the O2 fails and goes dead or goes low, the computer's gonna interpret that and it's gonna say, hey man, add more fuel. So the typical thing is your O2 sensor starts to fail, it starts to go low, and now your car is running around and it's uh, running way too rich, okay? So that's how these things normally will play out because the condition is, you know, the commands opposite the condition. Okay, back to the P0420, this is actually, grabbed out of the Toyota manual and they show, okay, well, here's our catalytic converter right here. Okay. And uh, of course, you know, just like we talked about an O2 sensor needs to get to be 600 degrees before it starts working. That's why we'll put a heater on there. Like this O2 sensor that I have is four wire O2. It's got a heater circuit on it to get it up to temperature faster. The catalytic converter doesn't start working when he's cold either. He has to heat up to start working, okay? But once everything's nice and hot, what should happen is the O2 sensor in front of the cat should be doing his thing. Rich, lean, rich, lean, rich, lean, just like we've talked about. The O2 sensor behind the catalytic converter, because the metals inside the catalytic converter have the ability to store oxygen and use that oxygen to burn up the exhaust emissions, it should be relatively smooth and stable, especially if you're driving smooth and stable down the road. So when you have to meet the enable criteria for the catalyst monitor, what you're usually having to do is drive on the freeway with your throttle not changing more than about five to 10% so that you're steady on the throttle and you have good load, good airflow through the car. That's when it can test out that catalytic converter. That's the enable criteria on most cars that are out there, okay? Obviously, if the front O2 sensor and the rear O2 sensors look the same, it's gonna say, hey, there's gotta be something wrong with the cat because he's not absorbing that oxygen and using it to burn up the exhaust emissions. And we're gonna set a catalyst efficiency code. So. One of the things you need to check if you're setting catalyst efficiency codes, first you need to make sure, hey, are the O2 sensors really working, right? Because if I had, you know, malfunctioning O2 sensors, that could maybe possibly give me a false 420 codes. Also, if I had an exhaust leak, if I had an exhaust leak that was maybe, you know, leaking air in, you know, right before that rear O2 sensor or something, that could throw this off enough where that exhaust leak could be uh, making it think that the catalyst isn't working when it really is, right? So you'd be checking for, are the O2 sensors working properly? Are the, uh, is there any exhaust leaks, that type of thing? Uh, is my fuel trim looking normal? Is it plus or minus 10%? Is it in that window? Um, and if it's all those things, it's likely the, catalytic converter. But I wanted to show you one more thing on our um, 
as far as our diagnosis, another place you could go to look and verify stuff. So let's see if I can get this uh, screen to share. Of course, um, hey, if I was uh, doing this, if I wanted to actually see this stuff, right? If I wanted to see this, a great way for me to do that would be to take a data recording. Now, some scan tools call this call this movies. Some other tools call these snapshots, um, but they allow you to do a deep dive review on what's going on. Um, so with that, uh, we have data recording with our tool. And what it says is you can enable recording, but it only is stored um, it's only stored uh, with the recorded date. It's only stored when you tap on the disconnect button before you shut off the car. If you terminate the scanner or shut the car off, you're going to lose this. Okay. So what I would do if I wanted to see those O2 sensors, I would take a little data recording with my scan tool driving around on the freeway. Okay. And because I don't want to get in a big wreck on the freeway, I would get this thing set up to record go do my freeway drive, pull off to the side of the road or in a parking lot where it's safe. And then I would review my data from there. Okay. Um, and I would look at something else as well. So here's what we're going to do now. I'm going to uh, clear out these drawings and I'm going to change this screen share one more time here. to where you can just see my whole computer screen because what I wanna do is get my document camera going here. Okay, so here uh, we'll get our actual, you know, the best way to test the oxygen sensor would be with an oscilloscope because it can do front door information, but for the purposes of our catalyst monitor and to see the trends, we can look at our scanner app using our interface of choice. I did find out, by the way, that these particular VPeak interfaces, they don't play along really well with um, Android phones. So, or, or no, with iPhones. They work well with Android. They don't work that great with iPhones. Okay. So here we have our car scanner app. I'm going to get something underneath this to try to take away some of that glare and we will zoom in on him. Okay, so um, if I want to, um, well, let's, let's, go, uh, let's go into demo mode real quick. Okay. So again, if I want to look at all my data, I would go to all sensors, all right? You can see that there was like 108 different parameters there. There was all kinds of stuff, right? And like I said, it's, it's overwhelming. So tonight we talked about building a custom data list. Well, if I was setting this 420 code, I would do a custom data list, but I would do that data list specific to my code, right? So specifically, you know what I want to see? I want to see what my oxygen sensors are doing both before and after my cat. So I would select something like engine uh, RPM, maybe load, and I'd also select those O2 sensors. What I, I tend to like is separating out my graphs. So I'm going to click separate. I can see I already got RPM up. I'm going to turn on a second one. And I'm going to go in here and I'm going to select the O2 sensor before the cat. So I'm going to say sensor one, bank one voltage. Okay. Then the other one I'm going to say is sensor two, bank one. So oxygen sensor two bank one voltage. And if I was driving down the road, or even if I was just holding the engine revved up 
to 2500 rpm and the o2 sensor before the cat looked like that and the o2 sensor after the cat looked like that they basically look the same you know what that would be telling me hey your catalyst isn't looking real good okay that's what that would tell me okay so there's an example of a custom data list this guy if i'm doing separate graphs can really only do a custom data list with up to four uh pids on it so you'd have to take like that great eight list and look at um, only four items at once. So pick four that you wanna to pair together and then pick the next four, okay? So that's one of the limitations of this particular app. All right, so I'm gonna get out of here because we we've, we've played around with custom data lists. Um, and uh, I'm gonna look at another section here that's that's uh, related like I could drive it on the freeway and look at my data recording now in order to do recordings you have to have this little box checked okay I made that mistake before where I was like trying to do a recording and the box isn't checked it won't record so if this box is checked it's going to automatically record but it only automatically records when you before you shut your car off you have to hit disconnect here at the bottom and then it will save that data, okay? So I've done that a little bit. Um, so here is a data file I took. Now, here's another, um, here's something else that, that's kind of limited on this tool. When it's doing a data recording, I cannot do a custom data list and just record my custom data list it's always recording all the sensors. And so what that tends to do, especially for older protocols, is really slow things down. If you're running a newer controller area network car, it's not a big deal. On my old truck that's gonna be J1850, it, it's, you're gonna see that it's a little bit, little bit slow. So let's say I wanna look at the same, same things that we were looking at. Well, I gotta find those, so bank one, Sensor one voltage, um, bank one, uh, let's see, oxygen sensor, uh, sensor two, bank one voltage, and uh, maybe we'll do this, and we'll do this. Now again, I like to do separate charts versus all in one chart. So I'm going to do separate charts. And here is my data and it doesn't look. Uh, that looks like that was a pretty, it looks like maybe it wasn't even running there. Let's go to this one. Let's just uh, click a couple things and see what we got. Okay. So you got a bunch of data files that aren't that good. Okay, so this is not a whole lot of data. You can see the time difference there. But um, OG sensor bank one, sensor one voltage, uh, sensor. All right, so now we can see what those O2 sensors are doing. But what you have to really do is zoom in on it to see what's going on. And so with this, if they, they automatically kind of zoom and stay on the same time base, here's what I can see off of this file is that the O2 sensor, um, oh, you know what? I was gonna say both these look the same, but I have, they're both sensor ones. So they're both the sensors before the catalytic converter One's on one bank of the engine and one's on the other bank, 
Okay. But that's a way that you could take a recording, go back and review it and see what it plays out as. Okay. But I have one other thing that, that would relate to this code that would be worth looking at. Okay. So custom data list, looking at those O2 sensors would be really important, graphing them out. Do a data recording, going down the freeway. Again, look at those O2 sensors. But here's another important one. I'll go back to the demo real quick. Non-continuous monitors. Remember, this is where we find mode six, our TIDs and SIDs, okay? So let me switch this back to my computer screen and our presentation. Um, or no, let's see. Back to the internet. Okay. So um, with a quick search on the internet, I was actually able to pull information on Toyotas for their TIDs and SIDs for the catalyst. Remember I said, you get these numbers, you don't know what they are. You have to decode the mode six data. So with a little hunting around on the internet, I got Toyota's information. This is from their uh, factory manual on their catalyst. This is for 96 to 99 models. So that would line up with this car, right? So it's uh, SID 01, SID 02, and uh, the TID is 01. So my TID is zero dollar sign 01 for catalyst. So it's the 01 test ID and it's the 01 component ID, okay? And you can see that that's for bank one, this is bank two, and it gives you a number. And what you would do is you would multiply that number by 0 0.0039, and it tells us our catalyst deterioration level. So anyways, if I switch it back to my um, uh, presentation, I thought I had a, I thought I had some mode six data up here saved and I guess I don't, but um, you could look at that. In fact, um, well, well, we'll switch it back to the screen here. So another place you could go to find out about the catalyst would be to look up the mode six data and see how well it how much it failed. So this one says it's uh, maximum is 100 and we got a value of 150. The test monitor is 01. Okay. So you, you know, you'd have to use the, you'd have to search to, to identify, well, what is that TID? What is that test ID 01? I'll go back to the computer. Oh, okay. That's the catalyst. And it tells me information about that. So another place I could go to figure out, well, if the catalyst monitor failed, how bad did it fail? Did it barely fail? Maybe if it barely failed, maybe if the catalyst monitor was just barely failing, I could, I could pour some of that stuff, that fuel injector cleaner, that guaranteed to pass stuff in my engine and maybe get the catalytic converter cleaned up enough to get it working good enough to pass. And that might get me through smog this year. Um, but if it's failing by a lot and I verify that the O2 sensors are good and that there's no exhaust leaks, then I'm looking at a catalytic converter, okay? So hopefully uh, that makes sense, that, that case study of how we can leverage not only our scan data and our troubleshooting process, but really we got to really leverage in knowledge about the car. Now, how did I get that knowledge? Well, a lot of that I looked up on the internet. I looked up on ShopKey. I looked at the component operation. And, and then, uh, you know, that's also the stuff that you'll learn in the AT322 engine performance class, which is a class that we are going to run this summer. So if you guys are interested in that stuff, even if you haven't even, even if you haven't met the, the prerequisites of engine repair, from what we're doing in this class right now, I think you will be well prepared to jump into that engine performance class if, if you feel like you're ready. Especially if, if you've had the meter class this, uh, this spring and the scanner class, 
you could jump into engine performance AT322 this summer, and I think you'd, you'd do just fine. So anyways, um, so hopefully that, uh, that makes sense, and we got to finish out that, uh, that case study. So putting all this together, okay? You obviously always want to leverage as much as you can from your scan tool, right? And that means we're going to use custom data lists to make things easier for us to see and also to speed up our scan tool because we now we learned a little bit more about those protocols and baud rates. The O2 sensor and fuel trim is really big to establish a condition. Now, we've only talked about fuel trim a little bit. We talked about O2 sensors quite a bit tonight. Next week, we'll go a little bit deeper on the fuel trim side of this thing, okay? Um, obviously, you saw some great examples of how you really got to apply that circuit knowledge to pinpoint those problems. And we had this example with the Lexus. We also went over coolant temperature sensors again. And of course, before you're done, like you make your repair, you always want to use that freeze frame data to meet your enable criteria and run that thing again and check for pending codes to make sure we have really done good verified repairs. And if you do that, you're, you're going to be a smart dude. You're going to be getting it done right and uh, you'll, you'll have happy customers, that's for sure. So that is what I had for you guys tonight. Um, hopefully that makes sense. Hopefully I haven't bored you to tears. I know it's a, it's a, long, uh, a long lecture tonight, um, but I hope you get something out of that. Covered a lot of big stuff, open loop, closed loop, right? Open loop, we're not looking at the oxygen sensors closed loop we're looking at the o2 sensors and we're listening to what they have to say okay um next week we're going to kind of continue on with this theme we're going to dive deeper into fuel trim and basically how can i tell if the o2 sensor is lying to me or not okay how can i tell if it's lying to me or not to really establish that condition am i running rich or am i running lean okay um so uh, again, I hope, hope you got some stuff out of that. Uh, we'll switch this back over to our um, home screen and you know, always research stuff. Like it only took me a few minutes to punch up the Toyota factory mode six information, especially because we were working on an older model. So it's easier to find information on older cars because they've been out there longer and people are sharing files and stuff. Um, so hopefully that uh, that makes sense to you. I'll get this recording uh, finished up and get it posted for our classmates. Don't forget, we got just a few quick assignments coming up for tomorrow. And then uh, the uh, following week, we'll have a couple of other little things. And basically moving forward, we're, each week, we're going to have a couple little things uh, for you to do. OK, um, so you guys hang in there. You know, whenever possible, keep scanning your cars, uh, keep learning, and I like to say keep having fun as well. So with that, you guys have a good night. Um, I hope, uh, hope you got something out of this, and we will keep, catch you guys next week, okay? All right. Good night, everybody. Have a good one.